Well, welcome, Nicole, to the Civic Leader Podcast. Um, Nicole Klein is responsible for the Policy Circle's expansion and relationship with key networks. She's been instrumental in the growth of the Policy Circle. And Nicole is also a Policy Circle leader in St. Louis. You are pursuing a really interesting program offered by the University of Missouri uh, that's called the St. Louis Neighborhood Leadership Academy. And you're learning about the various challenges that each neighborhood face uh, to become really thriving neighborhoods. Uh, you also are the person who presented the issue of financial literacy to the policy circle as a public policy issue, uh, because it's really one of the building blocks for thriving individuals, thriving families, thriving communities and society. So welcome, Nicole, to the Civic Leader Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, you, um, you know, you tell us a little bit about just your your passion for financial literacy and uh, kind of spearheading or spreading the word about its importance in people's life. Sure. You know, I think um, I, similar to what you just said about the building blocks in life, like there are certain things that are essential. And I think having a healthy body, a healthy mind, and also healthy finances is extremely important when you want to have um, an impact in the world. I think it leads to more confidence. Um, it leads to uh, better outcomes for you personally. Um, so I just think it's essential. And I also think since we are on, are on the Civic Leader podcast, um, how, this translates really into public life in a, in a real way that I think is important to emphasize and really underscore. And that's if, if we are not financially healthy. And see, I, I see financial literacy as a tool to achieve financial freedom. You need to understand what's going on and understand the acumen in order to achieve it. And so if we don't, if we don't have that tool really sharpened, it's, it's not a realistic expectation for us to hold our local governments accountable to how they manage their finances. And you know, I would argue your your biggest expenses in your budget as you kind of look at what you spend every year, it's probably not housing, it's probably not transportation, it's probably taxes. Um, so it's really important to understand your personal finances so that you can then hold, hold people accountable appropriately and really have the confidence to, to do that and make an impact in, in the world. Yeah, and that's why, so the Policy Circle published, the, so the, the Policy Circle published a financial literacy uh, brief uh, to really, and the goal is A, to frame the issue, really fully understand it, understand why it matters, uh, understand what has been today the role of government in financial education, and, and also what can be done locally, and what can each individual can do to really uh, enhance the financial literacy levels of our communities. So let's start. We will be going through the policy circle brief on financial literacy and discussing each of the section. So uh, let's start with, you know, the, the brief starts always with a story that illustrate the problematic and what we're talking about when it comes to financial literacy. Uh, J.J. McCorvey of the Wall Street Journal recognized his mother was recently widowed, living without a second household income, and approaching the reality of living on Social Security. But when he asked himself what his mother's savings looked like, he confessed that he had no clue. Like so many people of my generation, he writes, I had never talked in depth to my parents about their finances. Growing up, McGorvey explains his parents insulated him and his brothers from the worrisome and complicated world of credit cards, mortgage payments, consolidation loans, and this lack of communication compounds itself over time, leaving generation after generation without financial acumen. Had he known about his mother's withdrawal from 401k plan, for example, he says he likely would not have cashed out of his own 401k and would have instead rolled his funds into an RA. Luckily, it only takes a few steps to change direction, and instead of living in the moment or paycheck to paycheck, focusing more on simply surviving financially than living, McGorvey has taken it upon himself to get us better at living for the future. 
He has invested and educated himself on 401ks. He discusses financial literacy, shares articles and podcasts with his friends. He has even opened saving accounts for him and his mother. And now if we don't in turn have some of those conversations with our parents, we miss out on this incredible opportunity to pay them back for raising us the best they could with the resources at their disposal. And we kind of learn together because it's never too late to, to start. So, you know, this story really illustrates that still today, um, finances, personal finance is not something that we really exchange about and exchange about the process of uh, personal finances. Do you, do you feel that Nicole in, in terms of in your circles and, and what you see yeah, I think um, there's a couple things to tease out there. One is, as you kind of review the story here, what what strikes me is um, yeah, is something that Dave Ramsey actually talks about, who's mentioned in the brief about your fi- your your family tree, and how having those conversations can really change your family tree, change how your family um, thinks about money. And, um, and, and that's not a stretch to say, right? Because I think when you look at like millennials today, for example, a lot of them are holding off having families and having children because they've got too much student loan debt. They've got housing debt. They're just, they can't see how to bring a baby into the, into their financial picture. It's a real um, thing that I do think needs to, to be happening are these conversations between the generations to, you know, change that, that family dynamic. Um, I certainly think that uh, there has been a an unfortunate history of people. Just it's a taboo topic. It's just not something that we talk about. And if you do talk about it, it's almost coming across as like bragging about, you know, what you're doing or maybe your wealth. It's just it's it's a it's a difficult thing. Um, I am, however, encouraged by a, a recent movement that's really been taking shape um, a globally called Fire. Um, which is um, financial independence, retire early is kind of the acronym there. And I'm encouraged by it because it really, regardless of your background, your income, your expenses, the the overall message is you can do this. You can achieve financial freedom, which is what we're all striving for. We call it retirement here in the United States, but at the end of the day, that's what people are really striving for. Right. And, you know, that is... um, it's encouraging to see that it's, it's not a victim message, right? It's more right. of a message of empowerment. Like you can do this. If you, even if you make, you make $40,000 a year, you can achieve financial freedom. It, it is all in, in, in your, in your control to be able to do that. Right. And it's also discussions about the process, right? The tools and the process, not necessarily the numbers and not necessarily the goals, but the, the, but really the, the process of how do you achieve that? So, so let's, um, so maybe Nicole, why don't you take on the, why it matters section, maybe just restate kind of why it matters, you know, the next site. Sure. So financial literacy is defined as the ability to use knowledge and skills to manage one's financial resources effectively for lifetime financial security. Financial literacy is more than knowing financial facts. It is also understanding and applying this financial knowledge to the parts of our lives that depend on sound financial management, managing monthly bills, budgets, credit cards, and loans, having a savings plan for the future, deciding where to live and buying a first home, getting married and providing for a family, or starting a business and planning for retirement. Without a stable foundation of money management skills and an understanding of financial issues, individuals are less able to optimize their welfare and are more vulnerable to making questionable investments or to exploitations. This can even have larger repercussions on a state and national level, as it can lead to higher safety net usage, social safety net usage, inability to achieve financial independence, and overall lower quality of life for society, communities, and families. And if we as citizens are not financially responsible, how can we hold our elected officials accountable to manage public finances? Starting by familiarizing yourself with this glossary of financial terms, or to test your own financial, you can test your own financial uh, literacy knowledge with a quiz that's embedded in the brief. 
So, you know, like why it matters, right? And financial literacy, it's great to actually define it. And this is with every public policy issue, it's kind of let's start by defining it. It's really the ability to use that knowledge and skills to manage our own finances, financial resources effectively for lifetime financial security. And there is in here in the in the brief, there's A, a glossary of the financial terms, and there's also a quiz. It's really like six questions. And, uh, and it gives you, it compares your results with the national average and also the average in your state. So it's a it's an interesting tool to know where you are. And it's pretty simple questions. But I think that's what happens with financial literacy. You have to kind of be honest and starting with yourself in terms of, well, how what is my level of financial uh, literacy and my ability to also um, achieve financial security today, but also in, in the future. So I think, uh, and so. Yeah, I'd love to just underscore um, a line here in, in this why it matters section, which is, it is more than knowing the financial facts. It is applying this financial knowledge to the parts of our lives that depend on sound financial management. Meaning a lot of times it's not a math problem. We all can do math. It's more often a behavior problem. It's behaving, and you know, and, and if you and if you look at local governments as a perfect example, we all know what a budget surplus looks like. We all know how to get to a budget surplus, but behaving in a way and making decisions to get to a budget surplus is the hard part. And that's kind of the hard part for us personally in the in this when we talk about personal finance finances is making the right decisions and having like the willpower. Um, to, to make those decisions, just really like want to emphasize the behavior. Yeah. I would encourage everybody to take that quiz to kind of just, just as a starting point to see where you are so you can start plotting your path. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And it's actually the second section of the brief is putting it in context and defining what is financial literacy and what influences financial well-being. And there is this, this great figure here that that show that it starts with kind of your social and economic environment, what surrounds you, your family, your community, and influences your just general acumen and exposure to uh, financial decisions and financial tools. And then there's personality and attitudes. There's a decision context, how a particular decision is presented, and then the knowledge and the skills, what you know and what you know how to do, and also the available opportunities. And But at the end of the day, it's your behavior, what you actually do, um, that really influences your personal financial well-being, how satisfied you are with your financial situation. Do you control over your control over daily finances, your capacity to absorb a financial shock, your freedom to make choices, to enjoy life or achieve goals and being on track to meet financial goals or change your career. So beyond the fact, as, as you said, it's really turning knowledge into action is what truly enables financial well-being. And, and this is explained pretty well, I think, by the, the Consumer Financial Bureau. They say um, a sense of both financial security and financial freedom in the present moment and when considering one's future, that's really what financial well-being is. And this entails addressing all the pieces that influence are affected by financial management, from individual income and budgetary priorities to accessing jobs and educational opportunities. So it's it cannot just be taken in isolation. Um, I agree. I yeah. think uh, if we wanted to simplify it for people who maybe they're, if you're getting a little lost in some of the, the, the you know, oh my gosh, or, or overwhelmed, it's kind of like losing weight, ladies, <laughs> you know, you know how to do it, it is. But behaving in a way that will actually make your dream a reality. That's the hard part. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is behaving in a way to make your dream a reality. The only thing standing between you and that dream is taking action. And I think that's what's underscored here. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's work. The next section of the brief is, is kind of the numbers. And let's look at a little bit more, uh, dive into, you know, what are, what is the rate, of, what are the rates of financial literacy uh, in America? So financial literacy among Americans has been steadily declining. And this is according to the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority, Foundation. Uh, they did a national financial capability study. And the rate of financial literacy for Americans fell from 42% to 34% between 2009 and 2018. What's interesting is despite the fact that over 70% of American self-report being highly financially literate. So there's this kind of measure challenge. And um, in, in the brief, uh, they break down the statistics in terms of what are the levels of debt, planning, how people view planning, maybe the gender, race, division. So we'll walk through that. Nicole, talk a little bit about the depth here um, that's presented in the brief. Do you want me to read this section? Yeah, or? just read the depth section. Sure. Yeah. So the National yeah. Financial uh, Capability Study found that almost 80% of Americans have at least one of six types of debt, including credit card balances, mortgages, auto loans, student loans, unpaid medical bills, or non-bank loans, such as those from government or payday loans. Another 30% of Americans have three or more of these types of debt simultaneously. These r rates have remained fairly uh, constant since 2012. And um, when it comes to planning, you know, according to the U.S. Federal Reserve, less than 40 percent of non-retired American adults believe their savings are on track for a secure retirement. And a full 25 percent of Americans have no retirement savings at all. And, and this is when our Social Security uh, may be bankrupt in 2030. Um, over half of the respondents in the National Financial Capability Study indicated that they have not even tried to determine how much they would need to save for retirement. And long-term planning may be a burdensome endeavor, but Americans do not fare much better in the short term. The Federal Reserve found that 30% of U.S. adults would not be able to cover three months of expenses by any means, and 43% of American families would not be able to cover $400 emergency expense without borrowing or selling a possession. Only 49% of respondents do the to the financial uh, capability study indicated that they have three months worth of emergency fund. And, but this is an improvement from the 35% in 2009, but still just barely half of the respondents. So that is, that is an issue in terms of thinking long-term, and it's really hard. It's hard to imagine what you will need and, and to really think about life in, uh, in, in retirement or, or later in life of what you will need. So, um, Nicole, do you, do you want to go over the gender difference? Sure. So a study by Charles Schwab found that parents are more likely to emphasize budgeting with their daughters and investing with their sons. This gender gap extends throughout life and greatly affects women's financial confidence. Women are more likely than men to feel anxious about finances, and only 35% of women have even tried to determine how much money they will need to retire. In fact, only 17% of American women between the ages of 60 to 75 passed a retirement income literacy survey from the American College of Financial Services. Of women age 65 and older in 2007, 13.9% of widows, 15.8% of divorced women, and 21.5% of ne never married women had total incomes below the official poverty threshold compared to 4.3% of married women. Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll just repeat that that section um, just because you said 2007. So I'll just repeat that section. Well, did I? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. I'll just repeat it. Um, so of women aged 65 and older in 2017, 13.9% of widows, 15.8% of divorced women, and 21.5% of never marrying women had total incomes below the official poverty threshold compared to 4.3% of married women women I find uh, this this gender difference in financial acumen and financial readiness is, is surprising since women are so risk adverse and feel anxious about finances yet they're not 
numbers shows that they're not taking the measures to really be ready and, and take ownership of the finances. Do you have like some thoughts there around the gender difference, Nicole? Yeah. Um, I, I can't really explain it. Um, I think that I just, I, I, it is interesting to me as well. Um, I, I just, want to emphasize how important it is, uh, in this day and age to, for, you know, if you're in a relationship, um, you know, both parties in that relationship need to be, uh, open and transparent about their finances and, and either partner should, should feel, uh, confident and, uh, compelled to fully understand the picture. And I think, um, you know, as I, as I'm reading this one thing that kind of com comes to mind is estate planning and, and things of that nature. And, the, and policy does play a role here. Certain states treat different es estates differently, depending on what happens. And if you don't have a, a will put in place and, and those conversations are important, not only for, you know, what happens when you're gone from this earth, but you really need to understand, are, is your family taken care of? Are your kids taken care of? And so, um, you know, having some basic financial knowledge can help you get there to make sure, you know, gee, if unfortunately, if I had to, if I left this planet, is everything okay? And I think in order to really understand that, you just need to, um, you know, be educated on, on some of the terminology. Yeah, and I think it goes back also to the story we told at the beginning about having these conversations with your parents. I think it's the same kind of stigma or hesitation to have these really open conversation about finances with with your partner. And, and you know, the number of stories I hear of people getting married and, and realizing that their partner comes with a really big student loan and how are they going to manage that uh, together as, as a surprise. It's kind of, you know, this is the kind of conversation as you're entering in a, in a relationship and, and deciding to, to, um, to go on your life journey with someone, you need to be really uh, open and candid about and transparent, as you said, to use your words. And it, and it goes back to being comfortable talking about money. And it also goes back to women being comfortable talking about uh, how much they're making, ra asking for raise, pursuing career that will lead to strong financial stability as well. It, it kind of all ties together. I think, um, you know, the other underlying thing here that I suspect might be happening is the breadwinner in the relationship really having, um, uh, more, more of, uh, of a say, or just having more control over things. And I would just encourage, like, it is an equal, this is just Klein commentary here, but it's an equal partnership and, um, really just regardless of who the breadwinner is, you, you know, um, oftentimes, and, and as I look back at my, how my parents manage finances, my dad, um, was the breadwinner, but my mom still managed the finances and had like the day-to-day -day operations of paying the bills in the checkbook and kind of planning out what their, their retirement looks like. So, you know, it's an equal partnership and regardless of whether who's making more or less, it, it just needs to be transparent to, for you to understand. So I think that might be an underlying thing here yeah. of why what's going yeah, on. Absolutely. So there's another uh, section here in the, in the brief on, on just race, you know, mm -hmm. blacks 41% mm -hmm. and Hispanic 38% respondents to this national financial capability study were more likely to report having trouble in covering unexpected expenses compared to white respondents at 27%. In the 2019 Personal Finance Index from the Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of America and George Washington University, white participants answered 55% of the questions correctly, whereas black participants answered 38% of the questions correctly. Uh, this gap remains after controlling for other socioeconomic factors, such as gender, education, marital status, and household income. So that is another, another factor to, to just take into consideration. One thing that's not mentioned in the brief, and my reaction was, I wonder what are the rates with immigrants, with, with immigrant population here in the U.S., because it, it is also something it's getting more and more complex, uh, personal finance and the choices that you have to make that are available to you as well. Uh, and I wonder what that number is or, you know, where that analysis would be uh, for immigrants or non-native English speakers. Um, I, I wonder where it is. So 
That's yeah, definitely. That would be that would be good to include. Yeah. Um, so, Nicole, did you want to tell us students take the next? Mm -hmm. Sure. So, student loan debt is the second largest debt category behind mortgage debt and higher than both credit card and auto loans. In the U.S., close to 45 million borrowers owe over 1.5 trillion with a T in student uh, in student loans. Across income levels, about 44 percent of national financial capability study respondents, which are ages 18 to 34, have student loans they need to repay. Of those, 42% had been late with a payment at least once that year, and 48% expressed concern about being unable to pay off their student loans. Older cohorts also faced the stressor stressors of debt. In fact, the federal student loan portfolio shows that 35 to 49 age group owes more than 25 uh, owes more than the 25 to 34 age group demonstrating that repaying loans can be a burden that remains well into years when people are having uh, children and, and buying homes which is something that we talked about earlier yeah and that's right i mean the student loan and i think we are recording this in the middle of this global pandemic and uh we're families are really reconsidering the value that they are getting uh, for what they pay to uh, to go to college. And I think this will be a really, it's a big consideration uh, now in, uh, in today's environment as to whether or not we want to carry this level of debt for not necessarily uh, the, the income level that we would expect from spending that much on, uh, on an education. So... The next section here is about the role of government. So the policy circle briefs always structure, frame the issue as we did today in terms of the numbers. And, and then what is the role of government at the federal level, at the state level, and the role of civil society, private sector, that as we look at it today, how what is being played out. So the, at the federal level, the Treasury Department mandates is to maintain a strong economy by promoting the conditions that enable economic growth and stability at home and abroad. However, the department also acknowledges that federal agencies are not solely or even predominantly responsible for providing financial education to Americans. Instead, it recommends the federal role in financial literacy education be developing and implementing policy, encouraging research, and developing educational resources as needed, rather than trying to reach every American directly. Reaching Americans directly is really left to local communities and, and the states. Um, annually, the federal government spends close to $300 million on financial literacy and education programs to educate Americans. So these activities span 23 federal agencies and entities, ranging from the Federal Deposit, Deposit Insurance Corporation's Money Smart Program to the National Credit Union Administration's Financial Literacy and Education Resource Center to Financial Literacy and Education Commission's My Money Resources. So the federal government, and there's a graph here that explains the spending on financial literacy and education. Um, that's actually really interesting and worth looking, diving into. And this is in dollars in 2017. So there's about $125 million spent on military and veterans in, in financial literacy. About 56 million that relates to housing. Uh, another 36% is basic finance, uh, 36 million around basic financial capability. 26 million on investor education. And then there's 18 million for post-secondary education, 4.7 million around K-12 education, and social security education is just 3.5 million, and non-social uh, security um, SSA retirement education is 2.2 million. So this is an interesting distribution. And um, I'd like to highlight here in, in the brief, there's there's a few highlights about different the key agencies, and it's worth following and understanding what's being done right now. If you want to become active in this space, 
the, it's, it's value add to actually look at what is the government actually doing and there might be programs or information that can be amplified instead of creating something from scratch. Um, Financial Literacy and Education Commission. So the Fair and Accurate Credit Transaction Act of 2003 established the Financial Literacy and Education Commission. It's called FLEC under the Department of Treasury's Office of Consumer Policy. And the commission is comprised of over 20 federal agencies from the Department of Defense and Labor to the Federal Agency Emergency Management Agency and the Small Business Administration. And it was tasked with developing a national strategy on financial education and a national financial education website that's called mymoney.gov through which consumers can access financial education tools and resources. Um, again, the question, I mean, this information is, is provided to you so that you can perhaps engage with your representative in Congress to say, well, what kind of oversight does Congress have over you know, these agencies and how effective these, these programs are would be a great topic of conversation with uh, your representative. When you say, Nicole, I mean, this is- Sure, yeah. I mean, you could take this in a lot of different directions. It would also- um, I encourage you, whether you have kids in your your school system or not, it would be good to to engage your board of education member about this issue to see what's going on in your school or in your district. Um, I find it alarming that just given how this uh, topic is spread throughout twenty three federal agencies, as is listed here in the brief, it's clearly not a priority. And um, when I look at what is what are what are priorities for teaching our kids, um, I think uh, them being able to uh, be self-sustaining and put a roof over their head, having the tools to do that is something that um, is a priority. So that's my opinion here. And, and yeah. that's kind of what I gleaned from this. So really even start if, if Congress, if talking to your congressperson about this is, is um, maybe too intimidating, start with just your local community and your board of education and see what's currently on the books, understand how, how is this being taught? If it's even being taught in the school system. Yeah. And I think we'll get dive into this a little bit more later on, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting that so much is being spent that spans through a lot of agencies again, and, and there's not a real accountability and, and measure of the, uh, the effectiveness to me is what I get. Uh, there's a section here about the role of the consumer financial protection bureau. Uh, the CFPB uh, was established as part of the Dodd-Frank wall street reform and consumer Project Act uh, after the 2008-2009 financial crisis. And the CFPB has oversight of financial consumer, consumer financial products, including checking and saving accounts, payday loans, credit cards, mortgages, and is also tasked with conducting financial education programs. And through these programs, the CFPB protects consumers by empowering them to help themselves protect their own interests, build skills, strengthen their financial decision-making, and choose the financial products and services that best fit their needs. And uh, this was a quote from uh, the director, uh, Kathleen Kraninger of the CFPB. Uh, so the CFPB has an interactive program that had, had successes with many receiving helpfulness ratings as at least 80%. In 2019, over 5.4 million people used the Ask CFPB education tool for resources, how-to guides, and answers to common financial questions. So that's another resource uh, that is out there for adults to uh, gain, to sharpen their financial acumen. One thing that's interesting, there's a lot of overlap. You know, the CFPB program successes stand out amongst the multiple education activities and programs across a number of federal agencies. And according to the Treasury Department, this is primarily because many of these programs lack reporting and metrics for measuring program effectiveness. Additionally, there are over 40 federal websites on financial education topics, resulting in fragmented and confusing system for providing information to the public. And reports from the Office of Management and Budget, the OMB, and the Government Accountability Office both note that financial education activities exist in many different agencies 
often with child requirement that use or build on program or resources already paid for by taxpayers. So for example, the CFPB does not consolidate any of the existing financial education programs across various agencies. And the Treasury Department described the flag as an information sharing body among federal agencies with limited success advancing a national strategy to promote access to quality financial education for all Americans. So, I mean, this is this is the problematic, but I think this is great information to really start looking and engaging with what our federal government is doing in, in this space, uh, especially if you, if any of us is trying to move the needle and have an impact in financial literacy um, education. So the next section here is about the state level and also the role of the private sector. Nicole, do you want to talk a little bit about the state here and uh, what the brief has on uh, the state's role in financial literacy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the chart above, which is listed in the brief, only a very small portion of the 300 million in federal funding for financial literacy goes to K through 12 and post-secondary education. In the U.S., education is primarily a state and local responsibility. According to the Department of Education, it is states and communities as well as private and uh, public and private organizations of all kinds that establish schools and colleges, develop curricula, and determine requirements for enrollment and graduation. In fact, the Department of Education estimates that at the elementary and secondary levels, over 90% of all education funds come from non-federal sources. This means that deciding whether and how to incorporate financial literacy education into education curricula is left to the states. It also means that when citizens petition for more financial literacy education in their school districts, they are addressing their concerns to state and local governments, school districts, and boards of education. As a result, many endeavors are state-based public-private partnerships, such as the New Jersey Coalition for Financial Education, the Tennessee Financial Literacy Commission, and the Finance Authority of Maine. You can use the Department of Education's resource map to access your state's Department of Education and see administrators, offices, services, and resources. Yeah, so that's interesting. I used the map and I went and looked for Illinois, and then that brought me to the Department of Education of Illinois, and then I did a search for financial literacy. And there is a law in um, in, in Illinois that is, and it's called consumer education. And there's a law to provide consumer education uh, to high schoolers. So, so, no, so this is a great way to kind of see what your state is doing. And then the big issue is actually the delivery and the implementation locally in your school district. Because your state might have a law and a requirement, but then it's really left up to the, to the school districts to implement it. So um, that's something to... Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and to back to your point about really engaging at your local level to find out how this is delivered and what delivers it. But this brief really outlines that there's a lot of resources uh, out there to deliver this type of education. So, and this leads us to the next section here, which is the role of the private sector. The CFPB uh, estimates the public and private sector together spend about six hundred and seventy million annually on financial education with nonprofit organization and financial institutions accounting for just under three quarters of this total. Many state and local governments across the country have been engaging in public-private partnerships with financial institutions and community organizations to tackle financial education literacy challenges. For example, the Bank On program, which started in San Francisco and has since expanded across the country, focuses on expanding financial resources to unbanked population. And the State Financial Officers Foundation brings together leaders from public and private sectors to share best practices and help state financial officers implement fiscally responsible public policy. 
The Treasury Department says non-government entities, including nonprofit organizations and the private sector, are better able to respond to the need to needs more quickly, develop customized strategies to deliver financial education, and remain engaged and follow up with those served over time. This has allowed a wide variety of organization and private sector companies to take on various aspects of financial literacy and education. And these organizations that thrive to implement financial literacy education standards in schools, such as there's a Council for Economic Education, Junior Achievement. There's also organization geared towards women, such as Smart Women, Smart Money, which is led by uh, State Treasurer's Foundation, and Elevest, which teaches about investments, and organizations that offer educational financial literacy courses, program, and resources such as EverFi, Savvy Money, Rock the Street, Wall Street. Uh, there's also Jobs Creators Network that provide financial literacy for employees. And uh, you can find an organization in your state with the Jump Start State Coalitions map. Uh, and there are links here in the financial literacy brief uh, from the Policy Circle. Financial institutions are another essential resource from TD Ameritrade's uh, Education Center, and I should, I should I'm going to restart this. Financial institutions are another essential source from Schwab's Education Center to Merrill Lynch, Women's Invested to Bank of America's Better Money Habits and Khan Academy. Local financial institutions may have also special programs. Wintrust Community Bank, a regional bank in Chicago, has a junior savers program to teach children about money management, and employers offer resources as well. And many companies have programs that help recent college graduates manage and eventually pay off student loans. So there are many, so the brief next outlines challenges and areas for reform, and there's information here about measuring financial literacy, teaching financial literacy, and then um, curriculum standards. So, Nicole, why don't we talk about measuring uh, financial literacy? Sure. So financial literacy and education programs across federal agencies lack a method of measuring their impact on the general public. If one were to exist, how should it be measured? Financial education standards or core competencies can provide, can provide a means for evaluation, but primarily for financial skills such as basic mathematical and financial concepts. Knowledge of financial literacy concepts is a good place to start, but where does asset management, including managing intangible assets such as your education and life experience, fit into the mix? These components of financial education are not necessarily something that can be taught in a classroom. The CFPB began to explore these aspects of financial capability with a financial skills, skill scale that measures not only financial knowledge, but also the skills needed to act upon and put that financial knowledge to use. After measuring skills and applications, the CFPB also took a step towards measuring outcomes. Its financial well-being scale is a set of 10 questions for consumers to use to measure their financial well-being. The questions are based on research to develop a consumer-driven definition of financial well-being to allow practitioners and researchers to accurately and consistently quantify and therefore observe something that is not directly observable, the extent to which someone's financial situation and financial capability that they have developed provide them with security and freedom of choice. Yeah, this is about the issue about measuring impact of financial education. And it's it's a long-term measure because you can have uh, the course or the education delivered in high school, and then you need to follow these people for through their life and, and see if it actually made a difference. So I think this is what the issue that brought out here is it's hard to measure what actually works. And we're making assumptions that Talking about it, teaching it in different stages of life um, is, is really important. And I think we need to look at financial education as a lifelong journey that needs to happen in elementary school, in the high school to be ready for the, the financial independence, and then through your first job. And at every step of the way, we cannot assume that people know uh, what they need to know to be effective steward of their finances. 
But that's kind of my takeaway from uh, measuring impact here. It cannot be just taken as one point in time. Absolutely. And I think, you know, when we look at, um, according to the brief, that $300 million is being spent on the federal level and um, $670 million is being spent between the public and private sectors, it's, it's um, a, a kind of a tough pill to swallow that we're not met, we're spending that kind of money and not measuring whether it's working or not. And so um, I would just encourage anyone who is kind of maybe watching their local governments on new programs that are presented, this is kind of an example of you want to make sure that tax dollars are being spent in a way that's, that's impactful and is actually achieving the goal. And you really can't do that unless you are measuring. So... Right. And I think like as a company also, if you're a business owner and you want to provide and, and kind of play a role in social responsibility or in your community, I mean, this is an area that you could really change the life of your employees, of your associates uh, by providing some financial uh, literacy or opportunities for discussion. And I think this shows that there's a lot of tools already out there that you don't need to invent something new. You could really participate in something that's there and, and, and also be wary about just measuring the value of, of what you invest in or, 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 or deliver. Um, the next section is interesting. I think it's about teaching financial literacy. So in 2017, a nationwide study of over 13 million high school students revealed that only 16% of students were required to take a financial education course before graduating, resulting in low level of financial knowledge among, among young adults. Only 28% of undergraduates surveyed in 2015-16 national post-secondary student aid study could correctly answer three financial literacy questions. Meanwhile, a 2018 study found that students from states from high school financial education course requirements had a higher credit score. And the Council for Economic Education found that financial education requirements were related to a decreased likelihood of holding credit card balances. So a growing state number of states have been taking action to address financial literacy. And as of 2019 legislative session, 40 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have a financial literacy legislation pending. For example, Arizona, Iowa, and New Jersey put forth requirement of some form of financial literacy as a condition of high school graduation. And Kentucky, Nevada established financial commission and council. Uh, the Council for Economic Education 2020 survey of the states shows with real progress in the number of states with graduation requirements in both economic and personal finance. Per the survey, 21 states require high school students to take a course in personal finance, 25 states require high school students to take an economic course, and 70% of high schoolers had the option to take at least one semester elective course in either economics or personal finance. So what's interesting is, is the curriculum standards and the implementation. So the laws are, are there, the requirements are there, but then it's the delivery and the consistency of the delivery of those, those um, requirements. So the Council for Economic Education established in 2013 a set of national standards for financial literacy. And there's a link there, you can see it. A strong curriculum can help students, but, but flexibility is another important component. For many schools and districts, introducing new classes presents funding and staffing challenges. Staffing in particular is critical. A survey of 800 teachers by George Washington University Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center found that 90% believe personal finance should be taught in school, but half of them admit to not having a solid enough understanding to teach financial literacy themselves. So both the Council for Education, Economic Education and the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center offer free training and resources to better equip teachers so they can teach these concepts to students. And it's kind of a chicken and egg issue here. And there's other companies such as Everfy that have developed digital learning tools that also help deliver this content to students in school across the country without strains on finances or teachers. Additionally, collaborations between private sector and nonprofit organization 
provide influential opportunities for students. There's a Chicago-based Big Shoulder Fund stock market program, for example, that brings business professionals into the classroom to teach and share knowledge with students about investing and the financial uh, industry. So to me, that's interesting that, you know, we can't take, uh, we can't assume that teachers would be able to deliver this. Uh, but I think it is up to each of us and even our parents to, parents to take an active role in financial education in the school where their children go to. And I have to say that after you know working on this brief and and reading this brief, I contacted our school and uh, and key teachers and kind of asked about financial literacy and how that was incorporated in college readiness or maybe even like some math classes. And it did have an impact because they're taking it into account and looking for ways to incorporate this. So I think this is a good example of how each of us, those of us who are uh, financially literate, strong, or you know, should really play a role into coaching and, and uh, helping others uh, deliver that message. So maybe you have some thoughts there. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when, when you look at, as is mentioned in the brief, that student loan debt surpasses every other type of debt, and then you compare that with 16% of students in 2017, as of 2017, 16% of students were required to take a financial education course before graduating. Those two numbers don't match to me. Um, if we are expecting students to leave high school and be mentally prepared to take on, in many cases now, six figures in student loan debt, it, it is um, alarming to me that most of those students have not been required to take some financial course. Um, we're talking just 16%. So... Um, yeah, that because they're elected. Clearing. Yeah, that's right. It should not be. It should not be optional. It should not be elective. I think it really needs to be a requirement. And it should not be a course that, for which you get a grade or you know a typical course. And then maybe it's. It, we need to be innovative in terms of how to deliver this, and so that it does uh, not only inform but also um, provides the skills that that people can. Uh, have to really move forward in their life and, and handle the, the financial uh, responsibilities that they will be facing. Okay. So that's okay. And I think this leads the brief here as a really interesting section about destigmatizing talking about finances. And we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, there's a survey that was done uh, about uh, kids and money survey, and only 15% of parent respondents said that they had financial discussions more than a few times a month with, with their children. And there's a really great video here that's around the fallout of financial literacy. That's a TED Talk uh, from Ryan Decker um, that I invite everyone uh, to watch and where he really stresses the importance of having conversations within families, that it cannot just be left uh, to the school and it needs to be each of our responsibilities to, to have these conversations about the process and, and the tools and the thinking and the decision-making around uh, finance, personal finance. You know, one thing I want to say too, Sylvie, is that if you're not having these conversations at home, your kids have lives outside of the house. They have friends who are probably going to be making financial decisions as well. And they're, you know, there's, you have to consider the influences that your children are, ha are receiving from other people. And they're going to see their friends are going to this college and taking out these loans. And so if you don't have those conversations, these decisions are going to be made for you de facto by other people. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. That's right. Um, there's another section here in the brief that's around confidence and personal responsibility. Uh, and, you know, this really states that regulations can only do so much, and that formal policy and consumer protections against fraudulent and predatory practices cannot protect people from making poor financial decisions. And this is from Professor Joy Cerrito of the University of Minnesota. Uh, instead, consumers must take it upon themselves to understand their responsibilities and their rights about saving and spending decisions. And so there's a piece that's about having access to resources that are an integral component of ensuring financial well-being. There are financial advisors, there's tax professionals, 
wealth managers, financial planners can offer advice on anything from long-term planning and avoiding fraud to understanding investment and financial risk. And there's also this concept of financial coaches that have a slightly different role. And there's a video here from Michael Collins, who's a faculty professor director of the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin that describes the unique role of financial coaches. And it's a two minutes and it's, and I invite you to watch it because it really um, kind of inspires everyone. I think it's inspiring because it, it teaches you, it tells you, you know, being a coach is really uh, taking people where they're at and their journey and their, and their lives and coaching them to helping them make the best decisions for, for themselves. And, and that's the role of a coach. And uh, I know the brief also mentions here Dave Ramsey, and I know, uh, Nicole, you've had some experience with Dave Ramsey's programs and Dave Ramsey's solutions. Maybe you could talk about coaching because that's one area of interest of yours, right? Yeah, sure. So uh, Dave Ramsey, he's a financial author, radio show host, and founder of Ramsey Solutions, describes financial coaches in particular as a personal money mentor because financial coaching takes into account one's individual circumstances and goals, and then tailors a plan to make those goals a reality. Whether plan clients plan to buy a home, change professions, or fund higher education, coaching can offer encouragement and support to adhere to positive financial behaviors and provide a much needed boost to self-control for clients. Um, so I, yeah, I'm um, a big Dave Ramsey fan. Uh, he can be somewhat polarizing. Um, but what is great about his, he has a, a system and a methodology and it's all about empowerment and encouraging. Um, and, and I think that it, this, this paragraph really underscores that he has a, um, segment on his show, um, that's called the debt-free scream and just the, the inspirational stories that you hear from women, um, it, older couples, like I'm talking a truly diverse uh, range of people who have gotten themselves out of debt and are now financially free. It's just so inspiring to, to see those. So um, I just really appreciate his message of empowerment and regardless of where you are and that you can do this and it's possible. And here's the hundred plus examples of how other real couples and, and people have gotten it done. Yeah. And, and, and also it's real concrete tools and system for you to really take control of your uh, finances and, and, uh, and achieve financial freedom. Um, there's a section here in the brief that's about breaking cycles. So the taboo intimidation and even embarrassment associated with finances keep people from having important financial discussions. And we talked about that when you ignore your financial situation says Shannon McClay, she's the founder of the financial gym planning firm in Manhattan minor problems happening on a regular basis build up to very substantial challenges. And when not addressed, these challenges perpetuate financial difficulties within families that can even extend from generation to generation. And that's called intergenerational poverty. So the Georgia Center for Opportunity Intergenerational Poverty Project survey found that 65% of parents surveyed have had utilities shut off and teens acknowledge their families are struggling from paycheck to paycheck. And at the same time, 59% of parents and 66% of teens and families experiencing intergenerational poverty defined their financial situation as on solid footing. And 63% of parents and 64% of teens said they would define their financial situation as the same or better when compared to others. So this is, this is again, like this difference, right, between the education and then what you see, where people are at and what they perceive their situation to be. It's like, regardless of the circumstances of level of income, if individuals do not see their current situation as problematic, there will be little impetus to address behaviors or change habits. So removing the taboo of talking about money leads to learning and the ability to identify problematic situations. With more learning comes more knowledge about where to find reliable resources and opportunities that build the confidence individuals need to take control of their financial well-being. 
So this thinking has prompted the implementation of financial education components for individuals from low-income backgrounds, such as families receiving social safety net benefits. So in Delaware and Oregon, for example, the temporary assistance for needy families, the TAF program recipients, have access to financial coaching services. And more on, there's more information on TAF and similar programs in the policy circle entitlement briefs, if you want to explore that together. But there's also like prison inmates are another population that can benefit from financial education opportunities. Having a basic understanding of how to manage personal finance and efficiently allocate earnings are crucial components of ensuring offenders do not return back to crime in desperation. And this is from the Center for Financial Inclusion. There's also, according to the RAND Corporation study, prisoners who participate in such educational program were 13% more likely to gain employment after release than prisoners who did not participate. So it kind of goes back to like financial literacy equates empowerment, right? A feeling of empowerment and control over your life because you understand how to navigate it and how to, to achieve financial security, well-being, and, and freedom. So it leads to so much more. And that's why when I introduce you and I introduce this, I really feel it's a building block for our thriving communities. Absolutely. So um, there's a population focus here on the U.S. and military vet veterans. And maybe I'll go to that, and then, Nicole, you and I will exchange about what people can do uh, later on. So there's a big focus, and this was another reason for putting together this brief, is that financial literacy among uh, veterans and U.S. military is, is critical because, because of what can happen to them and, and, and also the different ways that they— uh, achieve financial securities. So according to Eric N. Bulgen, who's a professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University, a sometimes overlooked factor in veteran homelessness is difficulty with financial literacy. A 2000 study, study of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans by El Bojan and uh, colleagues found a consistent correlation between money mismanagement and homelessness overall regardless of income level, demographics, or clinical factors, such as post-traumatic stress disorder or traumatic brain injury. In fact, in terms of predicting future homelessness among veterans, financial management proved to be just as important as income. So the resources that are available, one of the first financial protection measures for military service members was the Military Lending Act in 2006, which set a limit on payday loan interest rates for active military members and their family. And there's a Department of Defense study found members of the military are as much as four times more likely than civilians to take out payday loans, and that some of the largest concentration of payday lending businesses are around military bases. And some study have even found lenders can circumvent the MLA, particularly because veterans are not covered by these protections. So instead, in response to the awareness regarding the importance of financial literacy, the Department of Defense established in 16 an Office of Financial Readiness, and each military department has since implemented programs to provide members of the Armed Forces comprehensive financial literacy training, including a required personal financial management training course optional financial services and classes offered on military bases, and financial classes during a one-week transition assistance program during discharge. The Department of Defense also offers financial counseling for members and spouses and conducts an annual evaluation to measure the impact of this financial literacy training. Additionally, the department looked to private sector for further assistance. And in 17, the Army Reserve began working with personal finance expert, Suze Orman, to strengthen soldiers' financial readiness through a informal video series, town hall discussion, base visits, and written material. So this is, this is another area that it's kind of like you have to take the bull by the horn and really dig into and understand and, financial 
management, um, whether wherever you are in life, but particularly if you are part of a military family, you can't avoid it. You need to really own it. So I thought that was, it's kind of an interesting, it's a, it's very complicated um, for military families, especially with all the different types of benefits that they get, especially with veterans um, who have lost their, their lives or become disabled uh, due to their service. So um, that's something that's really important if you want to become active and helpful in the mil with military families. This could be a real area where your coaching um, services would be welcome. So, um, so, so there's there's a whole analysis here about the outcomes, a measure of the outcomes, and how it makes uh, a big difference. Uh, they've compared, uh, you know, between 2015 and 2018, where uh, military veterans are at in terms of their uh, having an emergency fund, having retirement savings outside of their employer's plan, having savings other than retirements. There's analysis there on the impact. So, you know, let's talk about in conclusion here about ways to get involved. And in the brief, uh, we structure, you know, the, the ways to get involved first in terms of measuring, right? What is being done in your state, in your community about uh, financial literacy? What is your state policy on financial education requirements? How literate is your state? There's different survey results. What's the financial literacy or related courses that are offered in your district for kids, but also perhaps for adults through extended uh, education? And is there a coalition or a task force on financial literacy in your community or in your state? Um, Nicole, do you want to talk about, you know, identifying who are the influencers in your state, in your county, in your community? That's the other part of another way of being involved and, and active. Yeah, there's a lot of different paths that you can go down. But I would say your first step is to make sure that you have a relationship or you establish a relationship with your city council member. Um, you can go directly to the Board of Education as well. But I think that your city council member has a broader view of what's going on in the community. And um, so engaging with them first to understand, you know, tell me, can you guide me on this? What's the history of of um, you know financial education in our district, and if they don't know, certainly connect with your board of education member. But the first step is you really need to establish that relationship with your city council member and have a conversation with them. These are the most accessible public servants. Um, they are there to serve. They literally serve neighborhoods within your city. So. Um, they are typically very accessible. And we, uh, at the policy circle, we have templates to make that interaction very easy. Um, it's a proven, proven method and templates and letters that you can use for that. Um, yeah, so I, and, you know, I'd like to add, you know, to that is that having hosting a conversation around financial literacy, a you kind of strengthen your knowledge and your ability to discuss this issue and also your focus. And, uh, and then you can not only talk to your city council, but also I think in your business, you could really start looking at, well, what are we doing to educate ourselves uh, and our associates on financial literacy? So you could look at your local business and then also your, your local uh, representative. Definitely, definitely. And, and I think look determining with this, you know, a conversation with your city council member or your board of education member, does a task force exist or what, you know, what's the current, just having a, a full accounting of what is happening in your, your district and your schools is, is just a good first step. Yeah. It's like, it's kind of measure, identify, and then, and then reach out, you know, understand, like uh, reach out, see if there are other groups, other people, you can really be a catalyst to move the needle on this and, and, uh, and make a difference. Um, the, the other piece is also, if you want to really be effective is to have a plan, right. Is to set yourself some milestones. And if your state, um, you know, doesn't have laws or requirements, then you might want to look at the legislative calendar in your 
your state, but you could also kind of look at the calendar in your city council or when your school board meets. And, and it starts with individual conversation outside of a school board meeting and to discuss with the, with the board to see, well, could this be, a, does it need to be a topic of discussion at a public uh, school board meeting? So, so that's, it's, it's good to, when you want to become active, to set yourself some milestone understand what is already being done, identify who are the players, reach out uh, on a private level, and, and then really set some key milestone based on important calendars uh, within your business, your community, your school district, or any networks that, that you are part of. And then it's really to execute. And in the brief here, there are um, several um, there are several resources about just educating yourself, educating others, and uh, and turning to various organizations. One of those is, you know, we've mentioned uh, Secure Futures, Rock the Street, Wall Street. There's also Lakelands University Office for the Advancement of Free Enterprise Education as an Economics for Heroes program, and they look for volunteers who can teach personal finance and financial education. Uh, in their community, but also to veterans. So this could be, you know, it's a program that exists in your community, but something to to look at. So model about model uh, what you are doing with something that works uh, around you. And uh, we, there's also, I think, the Council for Economic Education as an advocacy toolkit that could get you started. And you could really look at financial literacy as you could start to really take ownership of, of this issue and, and make it your cause and really change lives, I think. So, Nicole, do you have like some closing thoughts? Yeah, um, I, I, I love this topic, obviously. Um, I think, you know, in, in addition to, you know, the, the what you can do is, um, as Sylvie said, kind of start within your own sphere of influence, whether it's your own policy circle or your business or your family. Um, and I think that you'll find that the, the topic is less overwhelming when you figure out what, what you need to achieve financial freedom. What is that number for you? Because once you have a goal, that's kind of the point of these milestones for, for um, advocating and achieving some, some sort of change and impact. But you know, once you have a goal and you can, you can work toward it and put a plan in place to work toward it. But I think that um, we kind of so, sometimes get caught up in the minutia of day-to-day -day life and, okay, this is, this is the certain percentage I'm supposed to be putting in retirement. And this is what, and it's like, well, all going toward what exactly? So you really need to like step out of the minutia and come up and say, okay, this is how much I, my, I need and my family needs to achieve financial freedom and take an hour <laughs> to do that homework and figure that out. We spend so much of our lives working toward this. We need to really know what we're working toward. Yeah. Well, you know, thank you so much, uh, Nicole, for uh, for joining me today and discussing and reviewing uh, the Policy Circle Brief on uh, financial literacy, uh, where I'm hoping that this will really inspire you to uh, start discussions about personal finance and start coaching others and maybe uh, inspire you to play a role in ensuring that personal finance education is part of everyone's lifelong learning learning journey and maybe inspire you to write an op-ed in your local paper about the importance of financial literacy in, in your community. As we discuss, financial literacy is not a skill that we are born with as citizens. It is a skill that we need to hone, we need to develop, and it's a lifelong journey. And I think what came out of this brief is that we all need to play a part to increase our ability to manage and ensure our financial security and our financial freedom. It starts with ourselves to be educated, to have the right behavior and model it. It starts with discussion about personal finance in our families, with friends, and it also starts perhaps with coaching others and ensuring that personal finance education is part of everyone's lifelong journey from elementary school to retirement. So thank you, Nicole, for this informative and enlightening discussion today. And thank you to my listeners for tuning in. I encourage 
I encourage you to visit thepolicycircle.org to learn how you can host a conversation using the Policy Circle Brief on Financial Literacy, and also for ideas on how you can engage in your community to enhance financial literacy for all. Have a wonderful day.